Hello boys and girls. So it was pretty much three years ago um, when I had a phase where I made a few videos on lazy lists and uh, Cauchy sequences of rationals and uh, mimicking real numbers and so on. Uh, I have the bad habit of unlisting a lot of the videos I make. Uh, probably 100 videos are unlisted and only 60 are actually online. Um, but there were uh, these sort of videos um, and at that time, uh, it was in the dark corona age, I, uh, I wrote a sequence library actually for Python or at least I started. And one aspect was also that I was using uh, async IO and um, in this video I will try to stay under 10 minutes and, and give, ba give basically a pitch. Right. If you have never seen it before, I think you should know it. It's mostly used really for, um, you know, the network and distributed systems. Maybe that makes most sense. But I suppose also um, if you um, run some computations and you want the benefit that you can get out of it, uh, that I will explain in a second, um, then it's valuable to at least know that it is there and it's actually fairly easy to implement. It's part of the Python standard library. So that's what I will do. Um, my pitch is as follows. You know, I will, in this video, uh, as always, you have uh, some GIST file with some Python code that you can run uh, in the description. And the best way is after the 10 minutes of this video, you jump right into it and just try it out and play it with yourself. And I have a bunch of logs in the script. Um, uh, but I, I will, in this video, not uh, explain um, the locks, uh, you know, just to keep the videos uh, short, I will not explain the locks, but they're sort of self-explanatory. Uh, I will not talk about uh, thread safety, which is a topic, but it's also not a topic to where I'm very uh, much an expert in. So um, this is really uh, like how it works, uh, the first examples, and then you can play with it and, and get your result. Okay, and so my pitch is this. Uh, I assume you know what the Kolatz conjecture is for this video. If you don't, then please look it up. Um, it's uh, you, you can an understand the um, the Kolatz algorithm right as um, as a sequence of sequence. Like let's assume it terminates for every number, then for every input, let, let's say um, here. Uh, 32, you get a sequence of numbers uh, which describes the way how it goes back to one, right? Or like 30 here, you know, um, you start somewhere, you divide it, you multiply by 3 plus 1, then you uh, divide it again, multiply it again, divide it again, multiply it again, divide it again, multiply it again, and so on, and then you get to some sequence and it breaks down to one. So um, for any n natural number, you will get some sequence. Um, and the funny thing is, as you see here, so here's four numbers that I have computed, uh, 32, 30, 33, 31, and they have completely different uh, lengths of sequence also, right? So clearly the number 31 is the longest here, and the number 33 is, is actually, like, it's a bigger number, 33 is bigger than 31, but it's, it's a shorter sequence to get down um, to the, the one. And in general, you know, you wouldn't know which one takes longer. So, um, if I uh, tell you, um, if I tell you, please uh, give me the the the, the uh, Collard's conjecture uh, sequences for the numbers thirty to thirty-three, um, and give me the first result as, as fast as possible. Then, uh, clearly, the smartest thing would be to take the number thirty-three because this is com uh, computed quicker, right? Okay, let's say I rule this out because it's sort of a simple case. Take these three numbers. Um, and here you would be smartest if you took the number 30, which is might be the number that you naturally take anyway, uh, because it's, a, it's the smallest of these. But for example, it would be um, bad if you take 31 uh, over the bigger number 33, because this happens to be the, the longer number, right? So, um, my point is just if you have this scenario where you actually don't know how uh, cumbersome the computation will be, what you can do is uh, use this uh, the following very simple uh, strategy, and it might get you to the result easier. Instead of taking a number and computing the sequence, what you do is you 
compute them in parallel. Basically, you do for, for all of these numbers, you uh, do, do the first step, right? So you uh, for 30, you go to the first step, go to 15. And then instead of uh, taking 15 and going on, what you, what you instead do is you actually compute the first number from 30, 33. And then uh, instead of comp computing further, you actually switch to the next number and so on and so forth. And so in this case, after I suppose uh, 20 steps uh, of doing this, you know, this this basically zigzagging between the sequences, you would then arrive at, oh, this this number uh, is finished, right? So you, you end up um, with the result first, which is also takes the least amount of computations of course you have maybe in vain computed some other uh, numbers but um, the, the result is that you basically if you do this basically um, you know uh, vertically not horizontally if you zigzag around then you will end up with the result that is the smallest thing first and this is trivially implementable in python you just import a async uh, library and then you, you just use a keyword and uh, say where you basically want to have this this jump steps right in the function you 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 can have there's a mechanism where you just say effectively switch to the other branch and so it, it costs you basically nothing if you know that these keywords are there you can easily do this parallel computation you can jump uh, between the functions and that's what we will i that's what I will uh, describe in this, in the rest of this <laughs> three and a half minutes. Okay, let's say 15 minutes will be the video. So, uh, I have here the script. Um, uh, ignore the, uh, the bottom for now, this is the output. Uh, I describe what I do here. I um, What I do here is I, I take a bunch of exponents. They're uh, unordered on purpose and I will um, take 10 to the power of this exponent, right? So for example, n equals 1000, n equals um, n equals 100, uh, sorry, n equals 1000, n equals uh, 100,000, 10, uh, 10,000, 1000, and 100. And the, um, I will implement an algorithm two times or three times, what it does is add all the numbers from one to this number. So basically, for example, for three, add the numbers from one to uh, thousand. And you might know that if you, uh, there's an analytical solution, right? The adding the first numbers uh, of uh, from one to n always gives you n times n minus one divided by two. So in this case, there's an analytical solution. It, there's no point in, in doing this like by hand if you know it. Um, but I just choose this experiment uh, just as um, to ha have an obvious example where it's clear that the the bigger the exponent is, the longer that will be the runtime, right? If you have to add more numbers, you will naturally take longer. Okay. And so apart from this analytical solution, there's also this the very straightforward implementation. So here you get a number, you get an exponent actually. You take this number n, and then you add all the k's together uh, of... Um, from one, uh, in this case, even from zero to uh, n, and then you compute it, you, you have an extra check that is actually the same as the analytical solution, and then you return. And um, I have a, a computation function. This is implemented in a way to mirror the async IO implementation that we will see in a second. Uh, what, what do I do here? I take this function that we have just defined, the, the literal just addition function, um, we map this to our list of exponents, right? Remember, our exponent is this list of, of uh, six um, mixed up exponents. Uh, we map uh, this thing on it, then uh, we do this list cast. In this case, you know, this is an iterator. Um, the, in the list cast, it will actually be computed. Then you end up with a, with a list of six numbers, and then you return it. And below in the main function, um, I just call this function. And uh, because I have uh, these um, these logs here, um, uh, here, uh, this is the logs you see here. So if I if I execute this script, the whole script, then it runs through once, and at the top, you see here the the results. So ten to the three is this number, ten to the five is the, happens to be this number, and so on and so forth. You know, and it's clear that. 
this should take longest, right? Okay, and so uh, what I will do now is I, I have already Im uh, imported here the AsyncIO uh, library. Uh, I will use this to implement this stuff again, right? Um, but uh, what will happen is every now and then I will switch branch. So I think every hundred steps or so, I uh, say, okay, uh, you're not done on this, this call for this number, for this exponent. Go to the next one and, and com continue the con uh, computation there. And what happens then is uh, I have also logs here. I have a bunch of logs. What happens then is that the the the, the points at which these functions, the, the the six function calls, actually finish, is ordered uh, in with respect to the time the, the same time the uh, the same order as uh, whichever um, number is is easier to compute because there's fewer steps, right? So because uh, this is computed like so. The first function, uh, the first exponent with 10 to the one um, is just executes first, right? This happens, happens very early, while the the computation which, you know, adds our numbers to 10,000 is second to last and so on and so forth, right? The, the, the principle is cl clear, right? Because it will jump around between these functions uh, automatically. Um, it will give me the, the result that interests me first, right? And it's also like, let's say you have three functions and you know that at least one of them uh, terminates and the other might not even terminate. You can use this procedure to run this algorithm and the, the algorithm will terminate just if one of them ter terminates, right? It doesn't even matter that the other ones won't even terminate. So that's also nice. Okay, um, so I do this here in a sneaky way. Um, because this example is basically so artificial, I like I choose exactly where I want to uh, basically jump um, through the uh, to the other functions. I will not explain all the you know um, process and thread and event loop. All these words I will not. Uh, I will refer you to the the library uh, if you just you know search for the, the functions that I used here. Um, but what I will do here is basically. Uh, uh, a function which does nothing but sleep and actually i will use this with zero sleep so this function is basically just there to switch context bet between the functions okay and here you see that there are two relevant uh keywords already right so the only thing if you want to change um like a normal function to a function which can do this context switching thing is you put async at the start and then you have this um await uh, uh keywords as well where uh, semantically speaking practically speaking this is the 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 point the time where the the loop um has the chance of actually switching around so basically effectively what happens is every time um <coughs> the call of this function is encountered um you effectively pass on to the other function right so um look at the again look at the library description to get the proper like thread based uh, explanation but in, in practice um, this is what happens and you will see it here so again i have the same function now but I, again with the keyword that this is this async io uh, keyword basically if you have it down somewhere in uh, uh, like if you have any two links with the async io down there then you also have it um to have it on all the functions which use it, right? Uh, this is basically this forces you to use the, this async version of these functions everywhere. Um, it's the same implementation as before; it's just the sum. But here now I say that every hundred steps, okay, call this um, the sleep with zero. So the, nothing will happen here except uh, if you have several of these function calls going, it has the chance to switch to the other one, uh, and that's it. Basically, this is the same function. And instead of this, the you know before you saw that I have this this map thing, um, I, I create this in, this iterator object again. You know, ignore the lock. I will ignore the lock. This is just for your uh, practical help if you want to use this uh, on your own. Instead of uh, doing this list cast that we had before, right? I will scroll up again. So so. Here we had we had this iter object and we cast it to a list. And here all the computations were actually done uh, in in the order. Basically, you know, all of these were done. Now, however, um, I have this async IO uh, functions, and I use not this list call, uh, cast here, but um, 
or, or um, I use more basically. Um, I I pass this. Um, yeah, I pass all elements. So this, you know, this is the uh, ax quax um, syntax for pa passing all the elements uh, of this iterator as individual parameters, whatever. Um, <coughs> I'm a little sick. Sorry. Um, here you use now this this the, the one keyword that we need from the async IO library. We have these objects. Um, you then say, okay, actually um, uh, do the computation here and write it to the sums. Here in in these two steps, um, the computation as I described will happen, and not each function for itself. You know, it's not six executions, but since the, the numbers are high, there's basically a, a, a thousand blocks of hundred additions happening. Um, and the rest is nonetheless the same. And then you, you got the result and return it. And you know, again, uh, ignore all the, the logs. But what we get here is then just from... Um, uh, where have we... Here, here just from this thing here. This is literally the, the log here. You see this, um, the loop that is done first is the loop for just 10 to the one. The loop for the 10 to the two just happens to be the second one. So here you, you, you can also already sniff out here that, that the, the order is now um, sorted according to how long they take. Okay, um, I have here <coughs> then uh, two more like small features that I also present in the script. But uh, here is in the end the the main uh, function um, call for of this this standard computation. Then uh, this this getter coroutine that I have just defined, um, and these are just the two functions that I have this defined above. I, I I cast them um, into each other here, and um, I have also and, you know there's a legacy implement there, there's another way of doing this run. Um, but it does basically the same thing. Then there is also uh, this wait thing. Uh, this is also like there's a lot of features. I here describe only these two. What you can do is you can also say, um, you know, basically you're finished once you once you think you're finished. But once once um, the the first thing is 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 completed, right? first completed, as opposed to all completed. And then um, I do this here at the end as well. And what this gives us, if I scroll down uh, in the description, is uh, here. This is done this um, this wait coroutines where um, it actually prints not just the first, but actually the second, the first two. Probably they're so close to each other in the execution. Uh, and here it, um, it it just co computes to the first result and then says because you're you know you don't have to do the exit manual. You say, just say you know you you are fine with just getting the first result that's actually what you're interested in okay so it was also not 15 minutes it was basically 19 minutes <coughs> but nonetheless i hope um i will um maybe you can use this i will probably use this in the future video i have um uh maybe i build out my sequence library a little bit more it has some some nice features it's it's um you know before i i did these um in a lazy list stuff i i was into uh, semi rings like three years ago hatting algebras it has to do with that because um i wanted basically to do some constructive analysis implementation and there you can uh when I mean, you can use most you can view most number structures as semi rings but there you can also talk about the um real closed fields and all this kind of things and maybe i get back to that and uh to make some videos about this kind of stuff okay um and with that I wish you a nice remaining weekend.